This is our planet and when the day comes when there isn't enough oil left, how are we all going to continue enjoying burning the tarmac in our V12s then? Plus, before that happens, will we ever improve motoring's bad image of polluting the air with our foul exhausts? It's obvious that in order to continue enjoying the freedom of the motor car, plus arguably more importantly preserving our planet for future generations, we've got to find other ways to fuel our cars. There are uh, several problems. One is a uh, greenhouse effect, so producing carbon dioxide from uh, combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, the other problem is that, uh, for instance, with the uh, conventional oil, we have already used about half of it. So there, at some time in the future, there will be a shortage in uh, fossil energy and it's now time to think about uh, alternatives. But what's wrong with good old gasoline? Why not just make petrol cars more efficient? Well, car manufacturers have been doing this for ages. But in the past, fuel economy wasn't exactly a strong selling point. Back in the 1960s, Honda, for example, worked hard on the CVCC system, which created concept cars that used far less fuel. But the average American driver didn't give a monkeys. In America, fuel was cheaper than water, and most Texans had an oil well in their back garden anyway. But when the fuel crisis of the 1970s changed all that, and the Honda Civic CVC became a national hero, it gave a kickstart to the demand for small cars in the States. More recently, a big breakthrough in fuel efficiency came when Mitsubishi launched their GDI, or Gasoline Direct Injection range of engines. They promised that GDI power plants would be 20% more fuel efficient, with 10% more power, and with 20% less CO2 emissions. So here's the science bit. How do they do that? A GDI engine is the engine which uh, supplies the fuel directly into the cylinder, just like the diesel engine. And because of that, GDI can achieve better fuel economy and better performance at the same time. So basically, instead of squirting petrol into the inlet valves as we did in the old days, they pumped fuel directly into the cylinder, where it has a chance to vaporise before being ignited. The idea was to use as many fuel molecules as possible, as efficiently as possible. Benefits of GDI engines are lower fuel consumption and uh, less CO2 emission. And also, at the same time, it achieves more power and torque for our farm to drive, and it's a good feature for customers also. The new engines had many other optimizations as well, like using curved top pistons. But although the ideas in theory were fine, the great car buying public weren't going to buy the idea of this concept engine until they saw proof. So Mitsubishi set up a demonstration test drive, just a little matter of about six and a half thousand kilometers across Europe. Starting in Finland and with great ceremony, the intrepid independent researchers set off on a marathon trek in their Mitsubishi Charisma, with one of the new GDI engines installed. Would it really deliver what was promised? So from Finland, it's on and off the ferry towards Copenhagen in Denmark. And it's time for a refuel stop, but already the figures look promising. Less cash spent on fuel, you see, means more on crisps and chocolates, doesn't it? And these guys will need creature comforts for this enormous road trip. It's on the road to the Netherlands, another fuel stop, a careful check of the figures, and it's off again. There's no time to stop and enjoy the scenery, as it's onwards and upwards through Belgium, Germany, Austria and Italy. No time to sunbathe on one of Italy's beaches, as it's back through France and then to Spain and Madrid. I wonder what the guys found to talk about during this trip. Oh, I do hope they got on. So here we are in Lisbon, Portugal and the finish line and the guys have covered 6,429 kilometres. After 11 days of this very public test of GDI technology, the figures do stack up. The GDI does make more of standard everyday gasoline or petrol. GDI is quite versatile and has good potential for further application to either smaller or larger engines. And uh, I believe this is a new power plant for the 21st century. 
GDI engines can now be found in Volvos as well as Mitsubishis, and the whole project has been a success. But for many years, the holy grail of fuel economy in the 1990s was the three-litre car. We're not talking here about the capacity of the engine, but about a car capable of doing 100 kilometres on just three litres of fuel. Volkswagen actually achieved the three-litre car in 1998, a real breakthrough when it was unveiled at the Paris show. I actually drove the car myself while I was there, and I was very impressed. While most modern cars sip fuel, this merely sniffs it. This Champion fuel saver is also 150 kilograms lighter than a normal Lupo. The vehicle body is made of completely galvanised sheet steel. Aluminium was used both for the bonnet and for the doors. In addition, the tailgate has aluminium on the outside and magnesium on the inside. Even the heat-absorbing glass is lighter. The engine is a brand-new three-cylinder turbo diesel with 1.2 litre cubic capacity. And even though the 61 brake horsepower sounds puny, it's perfectly OK for such a small, light car. What we need is not a revolution stepping from today's powertrain systems to a hydrogen fuel cell car. We need an evolution. And the three litre Lupo is one of the first steps of such an evolution. It's a big improvement in the powertrain technology. It's what we call it's an intelligent powertrain, which uh, steps uh, the, uh, the gears as it is uh, best for fuel consumption and which has a big, really improved engine inside. So, once the 100 kilometre on three litres of fuel barrier had been broken, what was the next hurdle to jump? While others were still trying to aim towards a two-litre car, VW went one better and had a great publicity stunt to announce it to the world. Now, recognise this guy? No, it's not Victor Meldrew, but the outgoing boss of Volkswagen, Dr Ferdinand Piesch. On his last day at work, he didn't just get drunk and snog his secretary like the rest of us might do. No, he shocked the world by going home in a new concept car designed to go 100 kilometres on just one litre of fuel. This so-called one-litre car was to go from VW's base at Wolfsburg to Hanover with Dr Peach at the wheel. Now, obviously, he wasn't going to burn tarmac on the autobahn. He was going to tootle along very carefully to conserve fuel, while the huge convoy behind him kept out interference from any German Junger racers. Hey, love the personalised plates! Remember, one litre is not the capacity of the engine, but that the economy is designed to let it go 100 kilometres on one litre of fuel. Plenty of Ausfahrts to go past yet. Shame about the rain, isn't it? Well, Hanover's still 39 kilometres to go. I wonder how the old fella's doing. What a thing to be doing on your last day as boss of Volkswagen. Here's a smile. That's better. I wonder what music he's listening to for this world record attempt. So let's continue up the autobahn, sipping that fuel. OK, let's stop at a Rostov, literally a rest farm like our motorway services. Only here, I bet they don't serve curled sauerkraut or out-of-date Wurst. How's he getting on? Looks in good spirits. A little bit of checking and double-checking. A journalist asks if the doctor has any secret stash of fuel. Ha <laughs> ha, very witty. Now, if they could design a car to run off water, that would be a winner, as long as it's not at the prices of mineral water. OK, so off we go again. Final stop, Hamburg city centre. Die Ankunft, the arrival, with 257 kilometres on the clock. But how much fuel has he used? So let's top up his tank to see how much he's burnt. Then the calculations can commence. Nice sample, sir. You must be very proud. The figures on the screen converted to Imperial, 285 miles per gallon. Wow! So here's the doctor plus the new boss, Herr Pischerstrider, to announce to the press. Sorted, gentlemen. The Volkswagen one-litre car is an astonishing achievement. But we're still talking about using normal, old-fashioned, refined oil fuel. So what can be done for the long-term future? 